So extremely agreeable people are empathetic and compassionate and compliant. But the downside of that is that they are not that good at standing up for themselves and, they're, and so they're often manipulated and pushed around. Um, for example, they're not as good at negotiating for their own salaries. And that's something we'll discuss in a little bit. And my experience clinically has been that agreeable people, the consequence of their compliance is that they tend to be resentful. Because just because you're agreeable and compliant doesn't mean that at some level of your psyche you're not interested in a fair deal. And if you're not particularly good at negotiating for yourself, especially in the presence of disagreeable or antagonistic people, then you're going to be left with the short end of the stick. I think the typical complaint of someone who's very agreeable is, I do so much for other people and they seem to do so little for me. And so if you feel that way, um, there's a reasonable probability that you're agreeable. There's some probability that you're too agreeable and maybe you should stop being so easy to get along with. And that's one possibility. On the other end of the distribution, the antagonistic end, well, if you're antagonistic enough, you end up in prison. It's the best personality predictor of antisocial behavior. and seems to be associated with sort of cold-blooded aggression rather than the reactive form which would be more characteristic of negative emotion, neuroticism. So, and I think that people who are lower in agreeableness or higher antagonism are probably predatory. Now, you know, human beings are pre predators and we have been for a huge swath of our evolutionary history, maybe for all of it, you know, maybe not when we were one-celled animals, but for a huge, a huge chunk of it, and during that time, our capacity to be predators has definitely been key to our survival. Um, we perhaps started to cook two million years ago. It's a very peculiar human activity, you know, the use of fire in cooking, and there's no other animals that do that. Um, it made meat much more digestible for us. It shortened the length of our digestive system a lot. So if you look at human beings compared to chimpanzees, you know what a chimpanzee is shaped, eh? They're sort of shaped like this. And it's because a chimpanzee is mostly intestines. And the reason for that is because they mostly eat leaves. They do hunt, though. They will catch monkeys, but they mostly eat leaves. And so most of what a chimpanzee's life consists of is sitting around chewing leaves and then digesting them because leaves are not particularly nutritious. Whereas human beings, we figured out how to hunt very effectively and then we figured out how to use fire and fire makes almost everything more digestible and increases the, the, the caloric efficiency of the food and it, in, it, in particular it meat, makes meat more digestible and so that meant that we could decrease the length of our gut and increase the length of our the size of our brain which seems like a pretty good trade-off fundamentally so, so agreeableness is one of the five dimensions of the big five, we all know that, and it can be broken down into these two aspects, compassion and politeness, and so you can kind of figure out how agreeable you are by looking at these items. They're all positively scored for the sake of simplicity. So, if you intensely feel others' emotions, if you're always inquiring about how others are doing, and you actually care, rather than doing it for the sake of show, if, you, if you're capable of sympathizing with other people, if you respect authority, if you don't like to seem or be pushy, and you don't like to impose your will on others, then you're an agreeable person. And a disagreeable person or an antagonistic person, obviously, is the opposite of that. So, they don't feel people's emotions very um, profoundly. They're not really all that concerned, automatically, about how other people are feeling. And they're not that sympathetic. Um, it's funny, because in my clinical practice, I can tell the difference between the agreeable people and the non-agreeable people because when the agreeable people come and they have a cup of coffee, they always bring me one. But when the disagreeable people show up and have a cup of coffee, they only bring a cup of coffee for themselves. So, it's quite comical, actually. So, now you might think that, you know, because our, 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 what would you say? Our society is at the moment tilted towards 
regarding agreeableness as a virtue, you know, because you should be kind and you should be empathetic and you should be compassionate and all those sorts of things. But our research, this isn't published yet because it's complicated to, to communicate and we haven't figured out how to do it yet. But what we've found is that if you push any of the um, traits too far, they fall off a cliff fundamentally. So if you get too agreeable, then you're dependent and you can't make decisions and so on. And maybe you're kind of a Freudian Oedipal mother too, right? You're so, you're so uh, concerned with your, with your child's well-being that you can't, you're not harsh enough to send them outside or, or make them do anything they don't want to do because it might upset them. And so that's not so good. And then if you're too disagreeable, well, I already said what that was like. If you take antisocial people who are in prison, you know, they're, they're aggressive and violent. And, you know, the criminal types and their, their predatory are low in agreeableness. So you can see how that's a bad thing. But then in the middle range, it, it gets more complicated because then agreeableness, where you're located on the normal distribution, how good that is depends to some degree on what it is that you are going to do. So one of the ways to think about how to maximize your success in life is to attempt to match your personality to the environment. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at how agreeableness plays out as far as we can tell in the actual world. This is, I should tell you too, this is, this is the sort of discussion that really people really don't like. Everything we're going to talk about pretty much from here on in rubs people the wrong way because our culture is very um, likely to assume that most of the differences between people are cultural in origin. And almost none of the data show that. What they show is that as, at least as your culture becomes more egalitarian, which is hypothetically what you're aiming at, the differences, gender differences for example, not only become more biological because you've eradicated all the cultural difference, but they also become more pronounced. So for example, the gender differences between men and women are largest in the most egalitarian societies, like Norway and Sweden and so on. And so the, the theory there is that, well, once you've eradicated all the environmental differences, all that are left are the genetic differences. And so that's sort of echoed in a weird finding in families. So, you know, you might think that if how you raised your children mattered, then children who were raised well would be more similar than children who were raised badly because that would reflect the effect of your parenting, right? So you've done a good job as a parent, so your children are more similar, whereas someone who just ignored them, those children are different. But that's actually the opposite of what happens, is that the children that are neglected are more similar and the children who are attended to well are more different. And the reason for that, I think, is the same reason that we see more pronounced differences in egalitarian societies, which is if you care for your children, it means that you make a very individual relationship with each of them. So you're not necessarily using the same strategies for each child, unless you think of them as meta strategies. And like a meta strategy might be, well, I get to know you and I get to know you and because you're different people, I react differently to you. And what's, what constitutes my philosophy of parenting would be act differently towards the children's differences. And so maybe if you're particularly good at that, your children turn out maximally different from one another. And that's because you're allowing their genetic differences to manifest themselves. You're not oppressing them, you know, and trying to cram them into the little box that you think that they should fit in. Now, the downside of that is that you're going to get differences, you know, and some of them might be quite surprising to you. So 